Support for this podcast comes from viewers and listeners like you. If you would like to financially contribute to this podcast, please go over to patreon.com slash TV or join us on the live stream, twitch.tv slash Davram. Welcome to Pirate Talk Radio, your podcast for Sea of Thieves news. There's always something to talk about, whether it be patch notes, whether it be bugs, whether it be exploits, whether it be cosmetics that personally I find beautiful, but ugly at the same time. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. to Pirate Talk Radio. This is episode 68. And I apologize and I also thank you for your patience uh, in waiting for this episode. Uh, As I mentioned in the last episode, uh, I have been traveling for uh, the charity uh, Extra Life and uh, raising money for children's hospitals. And I was down in Orlando uh, for Extra Life United and Children's Miracle uh, Network Hospitals Week. And uh, just a, a quick snippet of that before we get on to the meat and potatoes of this episode, um, because this charity is very, very important to me. Um, I got to meet a lot of the kids, um, got to meet and, and, and talk to a lot of hospital reps about what I personally do uh, and what my group that I'm the president of here in my area does uh, to help raise money and support our hospital. Uh, and really just kind of educate uh, as many people as I could on the, the the greatness of Extra Life. And again, if any of you want to get involved, uh, if any of you want to donate, uh, whatever it may be, extra-life.org is where you can find out more information about the charity. Uh, up in the top corner, um, there is a player search bar. You can type in Davram, and my profile will come up. Uh, there's also a link in the show description of all of my videos and all of my podcasts, if you would like a direct um, link to the donation page uh, itself. But my team, um, I took a team of eight people down, uh, and there was a series of eight uh, gaming tournaments that we took part in. Um, that was that was how many games they decided to do tournaments for. And uh, each game, uh, depending on your placement, uh, you got to raise money. Uh, for your children's hospital. And there were eight games. There was board games Splendor, Skipbo, and Catan. Uh, and there was also video games Halo, um, Pokemon Unite, Mario Kart, Magic the Gathering um, Arena, and Fall Guys. Um, I'm happy to announce of the eight games, my team took first place in five of them. Um, which was absolutely fantastic. Super proud of my team. And in total of the $150,000 that was up for grabs to bring home to your children's hospital, my team took home a staggering $30,000 that we brought home directly to support our children at our children's hospital. So again, thank you all for your patience in this uh, episode. I assure you it was for a good cause. I wasn't just putting you off. It was, it was honestly for, for a great cause. It was a great experience for me to go down there and speak uh, and, uh, and just really dominate the tournaments and bring home a lot of money, which is going to go a long way to helping kids uh, pay for their health care. So, again, if you would like to check out more information on the charity that I support and have been supporting for nine years, extra-life.org will give you all the information and give you the ability to sign up and start raising money for your local children's hospital if you would like to donate because maybe you're in an area that doesn't have a children's hospital or you just want to support, um, you can always click the link in the show notes below uh, the video or in the podcasting apps or extra-life.org and type in Davram in the player search in the upper right-hand corner. All right. So since I've been gone, 
there's been stuff going on, including a new adventure that has released, a new voyage that has released, some bugs that have came out of nowhere, and Twitch Drops. Obviously, Twitch Drops is going on and will be over by the time that this episode comes out. Um, so I hope you all claimed your Twitch Drops. I know I did, or I think today is the gloves, so I will as of today. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff going on right now in the game. Um, I want to I want to start by saying we are going to dive into Hungering Deep 2.0 or the Shrouded Deep uh, and really dive into that and and really understand what is happening. Um, it was I tweeted about this when I was getting my notes ready for this particular episode. Uh, and the only thing that I could really describe my feelings on this is it's tearing me apart. The lead up to this adventure was huge. Um, the potential for this adventure was huge. There were some highlights to this adventure, some very big highlights that were absolutely amazing and will be remembered for a long time. But there was also some really low lights that in my mind has put this adventure at the worst adventure of the three so far. And that says a lot, um, considering the RNGesus of the second adventure. So we'll get into that, um, but I will warn you, there will be some spoilers. Um, so if you want to tune out now, um, I'm not going to be talking about the adventure for a little bit here in this episode. I'll warn you again. Um, but if you want to tune out now, I will warn you, please note that you will need five people. So two different crews adding up to five people in order to complete this event. And that is if the game is not bugging at the time and actually allows you to complete it. So just be aware that this limited time event has some major issues. Just be prepared because I am at a point where I'm going to smash my computer and throw it out the window. That's how irritated I am at this thing. So, yeah, there we go. There we go. But we'll get into that uh, in, uh, in, in, a little, um, in a little bit. <clears throat> we got a response from our Would You Rather. We got some responses, but this one was very detailed. And this comes from uh, Twitter user Scummit. Yeah, Scamelt, Scamelt 666. I could barely read the L in there. Scamelt 666. Now, Scamelt went into great detail and didn't just give us a would you rather, but actually went into a, a lengthy description here. So I will, I will read this here. I would rather solo a galleon on fire, drunk, both in-game and IRL, through a skelly ship in the roar under a volcano eruption and being attacked by a Meg, then sleep on that comfy mattress they put in the sloop. That deserves a clap a clap -a right there because everyone who's listening to this episode and everyone who's listened to my podcast for a while will understand why I love that so much and will understand my hatred to comfy, all capital letters, mattress. If you don't understand that, you need to go back to the Comfy Mattress episodes of this podcast, and I assure you, you will learn my hatred for the Comfy Mattress, okay? So thank you, Skmelt, for that. Would you rather? That, that, that is a whole lot of angry over the Comfy Mattress, and I agree with you. I would rather do all of that than lay on that Comfy Mattress. Just stupid. If you would like to submit a Would You Rather, please hit me up on Twitter, on, uh, on the YouTube comments, in the email box, wherever you feel comfortable submitting a Would You Rather. And we'll read it if I think it's good enough, funny enough, crude enough, lewd enough, whatever you want. We'll read it. Let's talk about the bugs and some news, okay? So the first thing is a bit of news. Uh, so when I was uh, doing the Shrouded Deep uh, 
Hungering Deep 2.0, copy paste, whatever you want to call it. I noticed I was on Plunder Outpost and I noticed that the dock is being expanded. There is again a pile of wood and tools like we saw before a pirate's life when they were building the hut that Calypso um, lives in that you start the pirate's life. The dock itself has been expanded. There are some more uh, posts out in the water as if they're going to build more to the dock. There are piles of wood on the dock. Now, I didn't, I haven't had the chance to look at if any of the other outposts have anything like this, but it does appear that there is some new construction happening on the outpost. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Um, we haven't got our choice yet as to um, how we want the adventures to go, where we want the story to go. We haven't got that yet. Um, the Hunter's Call has always been something that people wonder if they will ever come to the outposts. Uh, it's not really their space, right? Their space is out there hunting Megs and the Kraken and, and fishing. So it's not necessarily a place for them at the outpost, but maybe that's something that's coming. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. Um, but uh, let me know in the comments or, or via any of the social media or the email box what you think is being done at the outpost right now. So it does appear that we're getting something else added to the outpost sometime in the future. Right now, it's a good time for them to start to hint at this, kind of like what they did uh, for A Pirate's Life when um, it was pretty much like the update before A Pirate's Life. We started to see that construction and stuff like that. We always know Sea of Thieves goes big during the summer. Uh, last summer it was a pirate's life. This summer I anticipate them going big again. Um, I've looked over the roadmap and the uh, the summer update uh, based on this roadmap would be season seven, um, partway through season seven, actually. And it's going to be three new adventures, uh, new ways to play and progress. Um, let me see here. Ongoing mystery. Uh, Emporium, things like that, Plunder Pass, that, that community day, right? And all that stuff. Um, and then season eight is expanded role play quest line. So, so July, the over the summer time frame will probably be closer to season eight than actually season seven. Um, so maybe it won't be so, until season eight and it'll be part of that role play. But either way, Sea of Thieves always does the summer big. Summer is always their big time that they hit right midsummer, July range. Whatever that update's going to be, it's been big in the past. It'll probably be big this year because that's what they do. Uh, that's kind of their their cycle, right? So look for that, whatever that expansion is to the outpost, look for that to maybe drop in, uh, in the summer update. So watch for that. Now, I perused through the patch notes, and there wasn't anything big that jumped out. But I perused through the patch notes, um, and I didn't see anything that would have adjusted this particular bug, which is hilarious, frustrating, and just, what in the hell did you do? And that is that multiple Krakens can spawn at once. I have seen on streams, I have seen double Krakens spawn during a PvP combat encounter out in the seas. Both ships get Kraken. There are two Krakens going at the same time. I have seen reports on Twitter and Reddit and uh, all the social media out, uh, out there that I've seen three and even a maximum report, even though there wasn't really any evidence to it, of five Krakens. That is a Kraken on every possible ship on the server spawning at once. Now, I don't know what Rare tweaked. I don't know what they adjusted, and I have no idea what in their spaghetti ass code would cause this to break after all these all this time of having the Kraken and knowing the Kraken has a chance to spawn when there's no world event up to one, you know, and one Kraken up when there's a Kraken, there's a Kraken and that's the only Kraken to now a potential chance of a Kraken on every single ship on the server. That is absolutely asinine to me. And I don't know what little, I, again, I don't know what spaghetti code we're working with, but clearly this code is not out of England. It is clearly out of Italy. And this is the best spaghetti code that has ever existed. This code is clearly so intertwined and sauce that no one knows tweaking one thing could fix, could, could cause such a ripple effect of breaking as to cause multiple Krakens to spawn on ships across the world. Something that has been set since the Kraken came out is now completely and utterly busted.
This is the type of QA and absolute disregard for any sort of quality in their actual code that absolutely destroys me and absolutely pisses me off every time they do something like that. Like, what did you do? What did you do? Add something new to the Emporium and somehow that links to something way over on Golden Sands, which links to something at the arena, which somehow reaches back into the far ass of Ashen Reaches, which then spews out something for the Forsaken Shore, which then double downs to something out of the Hungering Deep Part 1 to spew some code out by changing the Emporium at the beginning, if you forgot, that now makes Kraken spawn multiple times. Like, seriously, what type of spaghetti code are you doing? I saw nothing anywhere in the patch notes of any changes that you made to the game which would have caused this. So either you're not being transparent with us on the patch notes of what you changed, or you have no idea what the hell is causing some of these bugs. And you are literally lost in the soup that is spaghetti and meat sauce and some other rotten cheese that you've thrown in there and called it something pretty. It's, it's asinine to me. It's asinine to me. So if you're sailing out there and you see a ship get crackened and you get cracking as well, don't worry. It's normal. Just eat your meat sauce and move on with your life and just get the hell out of the freaking Italian restaurant. Jesus. Jesus. All right. Let's move on. To Hungering Deep 2.0. I mean, Hungry and Deep copy paste. I mean, the Shrouded Deep. The final act in Sea of Thieves three part series. This would be the point, if you haven't tuned out already and you haven't done this event, to tune out and then come back and listen to the rest of the episode once you have completed the Shrouded Deep. Let's recap, shall we? Let's recap where we are. Act one of the three-part act. Golden Sands is left in ruin. It is left in ruin. And these phantom forts from the Fort of the Dam, these memory forts from the Fort of the Dam, or from the uh, Sea of the Dam, are starting to pop up all over Sea of Thieves from Flameheart. We don't know necessarily in Act one that they are Flameheart, but, you know. You can start to think you play through and you sail around and you find yourself on shipwreck Bay where you learn through memories that are there unlocked memories that flame heart junior. Well, yes, flame heart junior, the servant of flame has pledged his loyalty to his father, flame heart senior, the floating head in the sky um, in order to help him in his conquest of the sea of thieves. Move on to act two. We find out that Flameheart Jr. has imprisoned the residents of Golden Sands in the different um, um, phantom forts across the Sea of Thieves. And it is our job to go and rescue them. Specifically, Wanda. Wanda with an O, not an A. Wanda, not Wanda. Is who we're focused on rescuing because she is the main focus of Flameheart's plan. Obviously, he pissed off Wanda with an A, not an O, Wanda, not Wanda, which is Wanda with an O, not an A, Wanda, not Wanda's sister, if we're following each other, right? Wanda's, Wanda is a sister with Wanda. One has an O, one has an A. They're both weaponsmiths, but Wanda with an A is known as the Warsmith and was the one that brought us the cursed cannonballs. For the longest time, and including if you go to her workshop, she had a really weird... I don't know thing for Flameheart. Well, that has since fallen out. And, uh, yeah, she doesn't work for him anymore. She's with the Dark Brethren, and they serve the captain, who we don't know who it is. And the Dark Dark Brethren is out there to, you know, get the Sea of Thieves ready for the captain, which is not Flameheart. Flameheart is a tool, is a pawn, is just a piece that they're going to move off the board when they're ready. So Flameheart's objective is to coerce 
Wanda with an A, the Warsmith sister, Wanda with an O, the Golden Sands weapon vendor, to join him and become his new Warsmith. She declines. We rescue uh, the people of Golden Sands. Hooray. And then we find out that Flameheart's objective to, in order to take over the Sea of Thieves is a full-out Sea of the Damned invasion. And in order for him to do this, he has to possess an ancient relic called the Veil of the Ancients, which Bell heard that it rests in the belly of the Pale One, which is the Shrouded Ghost. Enter Act 3. Act three starts with Lorena, who tells you that Merrick and Bell ran into some trouble fighting the shrouded ghost, and we are to go find her. And we find the resurrected ship, the killer whale, beached on a rock near the arena tavern in the center of the map. We talk to them. And we see a very familiar summoning circle table from the Hungering Deep. Again, this summoning circle table is for the Shrouded Deep. But again, the concept is the same, right? We do something, we play the song, we get the Megalodon. So again, it's a copy paste of the Hungering Deep just with a facelift. And Merrick and Bell inform us that in order to summon said shrouded ghost, we need to collect the souls of the other four megalodons in these little dolls. They look like megalodons. They're little purple megalodons with jewel eyes. And you have to do them one at a time. And there is one in each of the major regions of the Sea of Thieves, including, yes, including, Rare has finally figured out what to do with the Devil's Roar, Add it as a part of a limited time adventure to at least force people to go over there because if they did it, well, no one goes over there. So, we set sail. And we go to Marauder's Arch. And we go to Mermaid's Hideaway. And we go to Thieves' Haven. And we go to Ruby Fall. And at each of these is a cannon that you cannot fire otherwise unless you have the summoning flare that uh, is given to you by Bell. You load the summoning flare into the um, cannon. It fires automatically. You don't have to fire it. And it creates a beam me up Scotty ET UFO in the air that's legitimately looks like it's painting crop circles into the water. It's a really weird design and just looks really alien. It doesn't look mystical. It doesn't look magical. It literally looks like something out of an 80s, uh, 80s sci-fi movie. Like they, they have a dark scene, like a dark set, and then they have a green flashlight up above. And that is their alien beam. Like it's just the design there was the art design. There was just bad. Just, it just, it looks chintzy. It, like I said, it looks like something out of an, like an 80s sci-fi thing. Really bad. You get your boat, you sail over, you kill the Megalodon. The Megalodon seem to be uh, scaled um, based off the ship, just like a normal Megalodon would be in the wild. So I soloed the four Megalodons in a sloop. Uh, really easy, just like any other Megalodon. Put your anchor down, blow them up. Real simple. When they die, they do drop a full plethora of Megalodon uh, um, loot. Um, so, you know, if you want, if you've got the balls, put up a emissary flag and make your emissary value go up. I would suggest Order of Souls, as it appears that you get more skulls than anything else. Also, you get a decent amount of merchant stuff, but the gold hurdler stuff, you really don't get a whole lot. Also, a lot of meg meat. So, PvP meat, or if you still need meg meat to sell to the Hunter's Cult, you get like four pieces of four or five pieces of meg meat. Each time. So there you go. And there is a, um, it, it, I swear when I got close to it, I was waiting for it to go, hey, listen, it looks like a giant version of the Zelda fairy, just a glowing ball in the, in the, in the, in the uh, under the water. It's shooting a beam up through the water and a pulsating green, um, 
I don't know, pulse that is going out over top of the water. In my opinion, if they wanted to make the summoning of the Megalodon via the flare something cool, it would have shot up in the air. It would have been the color of the Megalodon that you're summoning. It would have been a standard flare up in the air, just a color flare of the Megalodon you're summoning, and the pulse would be going on the on the water. As it, as kind of like the um in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie when they're su- when the Kraken summoned, they drop the capstan and it sends out that rippling pulse across all of the seas. That would have been a much cooler effect than ET phone home, right? That the the ET phone home alien tractor beam thing was just dumb as hell. But if had they made the color of the flare match the color of the Megalodon, like their flare actually was, and it pulses out the color of the Megalodon across the sea, because they clearly had that in the code, because when the Megalodon dies, it pulses, right? It pulses. So they had that visual effect in the code. They just had to add it to the summoning, right? They just had to add it to the summoning. Just makes no sense. Whoever designed that... Miss the boat, like literally miss the board. Like they're in mermaid hell behind the, the ship because they missed the board completely on that one. Just awful. E.T. phone home. And you kill the Meg, you take your little fishy plushie uh, and you, you swim down to it. You reach it out and you put your interact button going on and you suck up the soul of the Megalodon into the plushie and its eyes glow. You swim back to your ship. You set sail back to uh, the arena tavern where you go back to the killer whale. You place the fishy on a plate, uh, probably for Merrick to eat the plushie later because he looks like he's a little hungry. And it's clearly a table with plates on it. So Merrick will probably eat that later um, for like dinner. Because clearly if you see the figurehead for completing this adventure, you know where the food goes in that household. Merrick's wife is very hungry, clearly. Keep the cooked flash splash tails away from her. Holy shit. Now I know why Merrick needs all the cooked fish and the other cooked meat. He's got to feed Bertha over there. Holy crap. You do that four times on the different, the, the different regions, and you get the four plushies um, with glowing eyes. And you lay them on the place setting. Here's where it gets bad. And I'm going to pause here and talk about just the lead up to this. So I did this solo, right? I did the solo um, approach to this because I wanted to see how long it would take. The RNG of of Adventure 2 was bad. I I spoke on that before. I I don't remember the time now, but it was over eight hours it took me because of RNG sailing around doing nothing but forts and selling in between in order to get all of the residents of Golden Sands. It's a really bad design choice by a team who's trying to make a limited time event with cosmetics attached to it. I figured they wouldn't make that mistake again. There was enough time and enough feedback that they could have changed the Shrouded Deep in order to not make it a poor player experience um, because of RNG. And they failed to take action on that. Now, I assume the Shrouded Deep was pretty much done. Well, let's be honest. The Shrouded Deep was done back when the Hungering Deep was done because it's literally a copy-paste with a facelift. That's all it is. It's a copy-paste from Hungering Deep with a facelift. That's it, all right? It's nothing... It's it, We'll get to the final fight in a minute because the final fight is good, right? The final fight we'll talk about in a few moments because it was good. That's the facelift, right? That's the facelift. But overall, they just took their code from Hungering Deep, they took Megalodon code, they slapped it all together, and they said, here you go, here's something new and cool and fun. And it's not new and cool and fun, it's yesterday's cold leftovers that you mixed up in a pot and said, here you go, as Rare has done so many times before. It's classic Rare. Taking stuff that they've done in the past, mixing it up, and saying, here's something new and exciting, I hope you like it. And hopefully the facelift is enough for people to say they like it. 
But I can tell you right now, the facelift on the Shrouded Deep has mixed reviews for a variety of reasons. One, one, and what's tearing me apart is the final battle, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is freaking amazing. It is epic. And I'll tell you why. But on the other side, the shit part of it is they added worse RNG. At least RNG of Act 2, I was completely in control of. I could use whatever time that I wanted to do to keep doing forts in order to find all the people of Golden Sands. In this, I am now forced of the RNG of being on a quality populated server. By the way, Rare, you said that your servers are shit and you've already reduced the uh, the ship set for, or the ship number from six to five and it's still at five. So your servers are shit. You know that. You're requiring five people, which let's keep in mind, you're controlling how many galleons, how many brigs, and how many sloops can be on a server. So you're talking th- two, at least two, if not three ships in order to complete this event. Somewhere between two and three uh, ships in order to complete this event. Which means you have to hope that other players come by and help you. That is bullshit RNG. It is bad RNG. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a second. So we've collected all of our thingies, all of our plushies, all of Merrick's snacks for later. And you talk to Merrick and he says, you know, you need five people, which is, again, copy paste from Hungering Deep back in the day. And you need to play Summon the Megalodon, which is a shanty that we have now. two hours and 43 minutes on the timer. That is how much time from speaking to Lorena and starting the voyage to putting down the final effigy or the final um, uh, Megalodon plushie. That is literally sailing from spot to spot, summoning the Meg, killing the Meg, and sailing. That has nothing to do with selling um, um, items. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's going no PvP. It was the best case scenario. Talk to Lorena, get the quest, set sail. Two hours and 43 minutes. I had a timer going. Okay, that's a decent time investment, especially for some players. Now you need five ships in order, or five players in order to start the last piece. I sat on the killer whale for three hours, three hours and saw no other ship, zero ships. Why? Because rare servers are bad because already the population is decreased because they can't get their servers stable. And this update brought forth other things to do, i.e. the legend of the veil and an increase in the Athena reputation, which means people are going to be grinding that out for ledger and that kind of stuff. Yes, this is a time limited event, but in typical sea of thieves player base fashion, the people who really want to do it are going to do it in day one and two. By the time you get to day three, day four, day five, people who wanted to do it already have it done. People who had time to do it already have it done. So now it's harder. Get into week two, it's going to be near impossible. Get into week three, good luck. Three hours is how long I sat after doing a two-hour, 43-minute sailing session in order to get all the effigies. Three hours I sat there, and I went to bed. Logged off. So five hours and 43 minutes. Almost six hours. Almost an entire day of work was wasted because of this poor design choice by Rare when they know their servers are bad and they know they've reduced the amount of potential players on servers and it's bad. Also, keep in mind, you may be saying, well, Davram, you should have checked the tables to make sure your server was populated. When I logged in, I did check the tables. There were two Athena boats. Didn't see them the entire two hours and 43 minutes. 
After waiting three hours, I sailed back to an outpost. There were two Athena boats and one gold hoarder boat. And in those three hours, sitting in the center of the map with a giant ass green beam shooting up through the sky, I saw no boats. Saw a couple skelly ships. No boats. Absolutely F, the lowest grade of F, 0% on actual game design on this the the theory the idea of what you're trying to do phenomenal a plus 100 percent the theory of getting multiple crews together to summon this great fight in theory is beautiful is brilliant but we don't live in a theoretical world we live in reality And in the reality of this world is you've reduced the number of players on your servers because your servers are shit. You have created a limited time event which requires more than just your ship, your crew. You have caused players to waste their time Because they want to complete this adventure. They want to see how this story ends. They want to see how Act 3 ties up. But are unable to. Because you have designed something that in theory is in brilliant. Is completely brilliant. But in actual practice. In actual reality. In the actual game. Is broken. And is not fair to your players. I am a huge advocate that says limited time cosmetics, you should have to work for them. And if you don't get them, you don't get them. But at least you have the opportunity to try to get them. This, you're not even given the opportunity to try to get them. You're giving the opportunity to have a chance that other players may stop by and help you. And that is not good game design. It is not in the player's control in order to get something done. Last week, or last episode, I talked about their official podcast. And in that official podcast, I didn't think there was anything that I really needed to call out. Because I thought they covered everything well. Now, I feel like I need to dive into that. One of the items which they called out in that official Sea of Thieves podcast was the reason they decided to do adventures. And the reason they decided to do the mementos, the cosmetics you get, and that was to reduce player FOMO. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. Because everything that we had seen so far in Adventure 1 and Adventure 2 was completely in the individual player's wheelhouse to complete and earn the cosmetic. If you didn't earn the cosmetic, it was because... You didn't put in the time to do it, but it was on you. You could have sailed another hour and done a couple more forts to see if you could rescue everyone. You know, it was all in your control. The player had the control as if, if it was going to be done or not. Now, again, I spent eight hours, eight plus hours to get all the the residents of Golden Sands. And that's just, again, sailing between and, and selling between. That's a lot of time for some players, but again, it's doable. It is in your control to keep doing forts and eventually you'll get them all. Step forward to this. And now it's no longer in the player's control. Now, some of you may say, Davram, you have the ability to server hop. Davram, you have the ability to log off and join a new server. Davram, you could join an Alliance server and get it done. That is all bullshit. Because that is not features of the adventure or features of the game. Yes, you can use the portal. But when you use the portal, guess what? The work you did to prepare the ritual is now gone, right? Yes, you have credit for it, but you left it back on your version of the the killer whale. You spent the time. 
So I have to go to something that at a time Rare was going to patch out because they didn't like the, they don't like you server hopping. It hurts their servers. But now they've created something that literally their partners on Twitter are saying, if you're struggling to complete this, server hop. Their partners, their advocates for their game who are supposed to paint this game in a positive light are literally telling people to do something that they have said hurts their servers, that there is proof that it hurts their servers, and something that they considered completely removing from the game because it hurts the game. That's what you have to do in order to find the people in order to make the thing work. Or alliances, which they have outwardly removed from their website as affiliates, and they've outwardly said they affect the game's economy in a negative way, and they're playing the game not in the way it's meant to be. Or maybe you just find a couple friends and you spike your own server. Guess what? Spiking a server is not in the actual game design. It is players doing things in order to get stuff done because Rare is not capable of programming something that fucking works. It's ridiculous. Don't worry. The story gets worse. I log off and go to bed. I get up the next morning because I know a friend of mine is doing a server takeover, which again, not game design there. It's an Alliance server, server takeover. That's what a server takeover is. It's basically an Alliance server for a special event. And they said, yeah, we'll have some time. We can walk you through it. We could do it. And summon it together, and then you can be on your way back to work, and you'll be done. Because when I logged off the night before, I was so infuriated, I was ready to uninstall Sea of Thieves. That's how pissed off I am at this. There are very few things in this world that anger me more than wasting my time. Time is precious. Time is valuable. I play video games for enjoyment, not to be, not to have my time wasted. And Rare's design of this adventure is designed to waste your time unless you get lucky. It is literally designed to waste your time. It is meant to have you sit there for hours on end. I see a tweet that was sent to me. This tweet was from at Tartan Snake at Tartan Snake. After waiting almost seven hours to find enough pirates to summon the Meg, it finally uh, they finally turn up and we put on a show. Seven hours. I waited three and I was ready to throw shit out the window. This person waited seven. That is, if you add seven plus the two hours and 43 minutes to get the effigies, that's more than a full-time person's eight-hour work day that Rare has stolen from you. Seven hours. Is, is sometimes a full work day for some people that Rare literally stole from these people because of their poor game design. It's unexcusable and it's unacceptable that they thought, again, in theory, amazing idea. But the fact that they can't break apart theory and reality to come up with a solution that actually makes sense based on the state of their damn game is completely blows my mind. Stop living in the clouds. Stop living in theory. Come up with great ideas, then look at the state of your game, the state of your servers, your player base, and say, okay, we can do this. We just have to tweak it a little bit. Had they made this for people, perfect. Why do I say perfect? Two hours, 43 minutes to get the effigies, and you, the player, are completely in control. Why? Because you could find four friends in order to do it, or join an open crew. Completely in the player's call. Is it as epic and as grand and as, as socially interactive as trying to, to, get, to get another player? No, but your game is not in the state in order to do that. You literally have reduced the amount of players in your game and the number of ships that you could interact with because your servers are shit. So you should have said, 
Great idea in theory. I agree. Now, here's the reality of how bad our servers are. Let's drop it from five to four so people actually can get it done. We're respectful of our player base. We're respectful of their time. And we don't make them sit on a goddamn island for three, seven plus hours. I literally want to go to Rare Headquarters. I want to go into a room and clear everything out of that room. I want to put a couple barrels in that room. Just barrels, right? Just barrels. Just barrels. And put a seat in the middle of the room. I'll leave the windows open. And I want to get someone out there in, in the thing. No, no, no. I want to get Joe Neat. And I want to get Mike Chapman and I want to take them into that room and I want them to sit. No phones, no iPads, no computers, no technology whatsoever. Take your watches off and you guys sit in that room for seven hours and you can't, you can only talk to each other. You can't leave the room. No potty breaks, no poo poo breaks, no smoke breaks. No, you can, you can have some water because water is good for you. You have to sit in that room, and the only thing you can do is stare out the damn window and talk to each other for seven hours. Seven hours you have to sit there because that's what that player and his crew had to go through because of your poor game design. And then you get to go back and realize how far behind you are at work and your emails and your personal life. You get to realize that you wasted seven hours of your life just like your poor game design caused that person to, to lose seven hours of his life and over three hours of mine. Ridiculous. Disrespectful to your player base. So I joined my friend's server takeover. We got all together. We did the effigies again, another two hours and 43 minutes. We all gathered around the table, all five of us, right? Requires five, all five of us. And we began, began playing summon the Megalodon. The top and the bottom of the screen closed down and the battle begins with the shrouded ghost coming up from the depths like some epic moment. Yes, we had it. Five players we had brought together around this table and we had summoned the shrouded ghost. It was time to fight. The battle rages. It's epic. It's amazing. The design was great. You felt like you were in a war. First with the shrouded ghost. Then all of a sudden ghost ships are spawning and shooting at you and the shrouded ghost phases out into the void. Just like the shrouded ghost we've now learned can do between the veil. It phases out. And then you have to do battle with Flameheart's forces. Awesome. And then the ghost comes back. And you have to battle the ghost and Flameheart's vessels at the same time. It's an epic fight. Absolutely epic. Music going off the wall. My adrenaline's pumping. I'm getting excited just thinking about it right now. So fucking hype. It was so amazing. And then all of a sudden you hear out of like, the, like you see the, the, the thing closed down. And it says champion of souls. And I'm like, what the hell? Cause I was down below, like fixing the ship right from damage. And I see champion of souls. I'm like, what the hell is that? And I come upstairs and all of a sudden I hear what I think is a voice. I, I could barely hear it. Cause the music was going crazy. And I think it's a voice and I hear, I thought maybe you might need some assistance. And I'm like, holy shit, it's Pendragon. Like, literally, when you see my video of my playthrough, which will be out on the YouTube, um, you can see how excited I was. Like, is that Pendragon? It's Pendragon. Like, I was super excited. Pendragon comes out of nowhere, comes up from the water. It's an epic fucking fight. This is what I wanted. This was the fight that should have been there to end this three-part series. This was amazing. You beat the shrouded ghost. The the all the stuff fades out. All the ghost ships fade out. 
And you go back and you talk to Bell and Pendragon comes there and he shows you the veil of the ancients without the stones. And though I was kind of concerned when he started to do the stabby stab with his sword, because last time he did that, we got a giant shit talking head in the sky. This time we did not And we learn now that we need to get these stones and he's going to take the veil of the ancients to the pirate lord, which leads perfectly into the legend of the veil. Which is the new pirate legend voyage, which I have not done yet. It was beautiful. It was brilliant. It was Sea of Thieves. It was that epic battle, that epic moment that I was waiting for. I almost forgot for a moment about the poor game design that made me want to throw my computer out the window. For a moment. I was pumped up and I felt, oh, Sea of Thieves, this is awesome. Then I opened my adventure tab. I completed the effigies. I completed Defeat the Shrouded Ghost. But I did not have a check mark on the ritual summoning of the Shrouded Ghost, which requires five players to play music, of which I was one of the five on that boat playing music to start the event. So now, I had to walk away from my computer. Because literally, all the love and excitement of that final battle was pissed away again. Because Rare's failure to put out quality code and design something that makes sense not only for player experience... But also, also, that works. So now, I've I've collected the effigies once. I've collected the effigies twice. I have summoned the Shrouded Ghost. I have defeated the Shrouded Ghost. But I still have to go now, collect the effigies a third time. So now, we are up to nine hours, basically, of effigy collecting. Three hours of wasted time where I sat there waiting for a player to come by on their pathetic dead servers. And now I get to go do the damn thing again. Talk about disrespect for your players. Talk about poor player experience. And talk about a complete disregard for your players' time. It's absolutely asinine. So, I still don't have it done. And I think today, when, we, when, when I stream this afternoon, or this evening, I've got some friends who are, are gonna, we're going to try it again. But I can tell you this. This is the worst adventure by far. Because of its execution. Not because of the content. The content is quality. The execution is is a complete and utter failure. If you took the final fight of this out, this is an F. A 0%. This is the worst failure of an update Rare has ever done in my over, what, going on three years now playing this game? I missed out on year one. So this is the worst content Rare has put out taking out the final battle. Worst. Execution, worst content they've put out if you take out the final battle. F. You add in the final battle, I'll jump it up to a C. Had you properly thought about your theory versus reality, thought about your players and their time, thought about three-week event, and how you know your players are going to burn through it, and by week two, week three, players are not going to be doing this, so players who don't have the time to get it done in the first two days are going to be miserable, and guess what? They're going to miss out, which is what your entire system was supposed to prevent. You have literally caused FOMO. With your design choices. No, these cosmetics are not part of sets. 
That does not... Having a cosmetic that's part of a set is not what causes FOMO. FOMO is the fear of missing out. Not being able to get the title. Not being able to get the cosmetic. That's the fear of missing out. Regardless if it's attached to a set or not. So your design choices are completely disrespectful for your players and are completely contradictory to what you said these adventures and their cosmetics are set out to do, which is reduce the FOMO in the players. Do better. So in summary of the first three adventures, Adventure 1, good, not great. Adventure 2, very fun. Too much RNG. Adventure 3, complete, utter failure as a whole. The final fight was one of the most epic things I've ever been a part of. But because of how they designed it and the player experience around it, complete and utter failure. And there you go. So now we lead into the Legend of the Veil, which is the new Pirate Legend Voyage. I've seen some screenshots. I've seen some videos um, of, of some people doing it and, and stuff like that. I'm excited to play it. Um, I'm hoping to get um, a few sessions of it in um, before the next episode next week. Um, but I hope it doesn't disappoint me. This, this act, this act three, this shrouded deep was a huge disappointment and an utter failure. That's just how it is. I'm sure many of you out there didn't have the same experience as I did. And many of you out there are probably in love with the Shrouded Deep and probably think it's amazing. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of other players who did not have the positive experience that you had because you got lucky. You spiked a, a, a server, whatever the case may be. Think about the other players. It's not a fair and equal experience across the, uh, across the board. It was designed poorly and executed even worse. Guys, thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of Pirate Talk Radio. I'll be excited to check out The Legend of the Veil and hopefully not almost throw my voice out because I've yelled for the past 40 minutes about this stupidity. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you haven't done so already, please hit that like button on YouTube. Please consider subscribing. And also, if you would like to financially contribute to this podcast. You can go over to patreon.com slash Davram. And if you are a patron, not only will you get mentioned in uh, an episode as a, as a, as a patron sponsoring the episode, but you also get the episode up to two days before everyone else. Thank you very much, everyone. Love you very much. Enjoy the seas out there. And hopefully I will still have a computer to record next week episode because, uh, you know, if things keep going the way they are, I'm throwing it out the window. Sorry. That's just where we are right now. That's just where we are.